it's um, a fabulous privilege to be here tonight and to be able to talk to you about urban peregrines. Now, my story is that actually I grew up in Surrey. I grew up in Epsom in Surrey uh, in the southeast of England and very much didn't really know peregrines at all. Um, today, I, I'm very much a sort of leading researcher on them and I'm doing a currently doing a sort of research project, a PhD project on them uh, through the University of Bristol near where I'm based in the West Country. But when I was 11, I actually saw my first peregrine at Simmons Yat Rock, which is in the forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. And that's now where I live, actually. I'm only about 20 minutes from Simmons Yat Rock. Little did I know that sort of 30 years later, I would be actually studying them and uh, seeing them on a much more regular uh, basis. But what I'm going to do tonight really is talk about the story of the urban peregrine. And I'm going to split it into two halves, really. So the first half is very much going to be about them coming into our towns and cities, trying to give it a bit of a, a sort of Essex theme, um, talking about their movements. And then uh, as I go into the second half of it, I'm going to be talking much more about their diet and what urban dwelling peregrines eat. And uh, this has been very much the mainstay, I guess, of my studies over the last um, 24, 25 years or so. So I'm looking at finishing probably somewhere between sort of quarter past nine and half past nine, if, if not a bit before, then we'll see how we how we get on. But this photograph here is actually a beautiful image of an urban peregrine. This is one that's in Bristol that a friend of mine uh, photographed, a big female here, very sort of barrel chested, larger than a crow or sort of crow size with the long pointed wings and very distinctive facial markings and uh, coloured legs and eye skin and what have you. And I think actually 30 or 40 years ago, if we'd said that in an urban location, you're probably more likely to see a peregrine than you are a sparrowhawk or a buzzard or a kestrel, I think it would have been almost unbelievable really. And yet here we are sort of 30 years later, 30, 40 years later, since peregrines have really come back from very low numbers during the 1960s and 70s and 80s to being very much in most urban locations across, uh, certainly across England. And peregrines are one of those en en enigmatic species, really. It's a fast bird, it's a, it's a predator, so it's got forward-facing eyes, which makes it very attractive to humans. We like things that have got forward-facing eyes that look very similar to us. And it's just, con and I think because it used to be such a rare bird once upon a time, it's got that kind of special kind of rareness about it still, um, even though it's um, you know still a reasonably common and widespread bird in southern England. And this photograph here isn't actually uh, a captive bird. This is a wild bird on a building um, near Amsterdam, taken by a, a person actually investigating the nest and checking out what's going on there. And I love this photograph of this this urban dwelling peregrine because it kind of sums it up really. You've got these huge, big forward facing eyes. You've got this hooked beak that's got this, if you look at it, it's got this kind of extra, almost sheathy kind of tooth here called the tomial tooth that helps it dispatch its prey. In its nostrils here, it's got these baffles, an intricate inside there, you've got an intricate uh, pattern actually of kind of nasal channels that help to stop air kind of rushing into the nasal passages of the peregrine and causing it problems when it's diving at very fast speeds. And we've also got really this very dark head and this moustachial stripe, which studies show actually this helps to reduce glare when the peregrine is out and about and there's lots of sunshine and ultraviolet light. These actually help to absorb some of that light and help to reduce some of that glare. It's a really beautiful um, photograph. Now, just to give you a bit of context before we really sort of dig into urban peregrines, if we look back to the 1960s, we were down to just under 400 pairs. And if you look at these numbers here, you can see the numbers have gradually increased up until about uh, up to about 1700 pairs in 2014. Now, I suspect that over the last eight years that, that those numbers haven't changed a huge amount. And I will explain why in a moment. But we, we almost need to go back before the 1960s, though, um, to when peregrines were doing reasonably well in rural coastal areas, particularly in the 1930s. Peregrines, like many birds of prey and top predators, such as um, mammals, including otters, for example, have always had a bit of a bad time during the sort of 1780, 1900s, when uh, they were seen as vermin, 
and they were then used in taxidermy and so forth. And then actually during the World Wars, the First World War and Second World War, they were shot um, by the Ministry of Air Defence to stop them from intercepting uh, carrier pigeons. So peregrines have actually had a bit of a hard time from us uh, human beings over the last sort of three or four hundred years. Um, so actually, when their numbers were doing OK, it was kind of in the 1930s, 1940s, before the sort of Second World War, really. And then in the 1960s, 1950s, 60s, we had problems with pesticides known as DDT and their derivatives, which were a pesticide used in the countryside and it affected their prey like pigeons. And the peregrines ate pigeons that had been eating crops that had been sprayed with this chemical. They either directly died or they produced eggs that uh, were very thin and broke under the weight of the adult birds when they were incubating the chicks as a result of ingesting this chemical um, through their prey. And once that link was realised, the DDT chemical was banned, not just here in Britain and Europe, but also across North America. It still does get used in other parts of the world, such as different African countries, but it's certainly banned across um, North America and uh, Europe. And then numbers gradually rose. And this uh, chart here, this map here from the British Trust for Ornithology shows how the breeding distribution of peregrines has changed over the last sort of 40, 50 years or so. And you'll notice that over across much of the British Isles, there are lots of upward pointing triangles, which um, are a red or orangey colour. But if you look towards Scotland, Northern England, Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland and Shetland Isles, you'll see that numbers have gone down. Um, and I'll come back to that in a, a little bit of a moment. But I've always said to people about the peregrine success that we want to celebrate the peregrine, but we, all, we must never be complacent about their success. But putting those downward triangles to a side for one moment, if we look down towards southern England and over towards Suffolk and Norfolk and uh, Essex, you can see that there's a smattering of upward triangles, really. And I'm sure that actually in the last 10 years since this, uh, this was a BTO sort of bird that this work, some of you may well have been involved with, with actually um, recording birds for this, I'm sure that there will be a lot more upward pointing triangles in the eastern counties of, of the UK. Now I just want to show you a couple of things that's going on. So we, we saw those downward triangles up in Scotland and if we look at a breeding bird survey graph for peregrines, along the bottom we've got the years from 1994, along the left hand axis we have um, an index basically which always starts off at, at, hundred, uh, at 100 and it's kind of standardised across different species and we can see actually since the 1990s, mid 1990s, peregrine numbers have actually sort of gone down in numbers and bounced up a little bit and gone down. You have to remember this also includes Northern Ireland and Scotland where we've seen some of these declines. But if we look across England only, then we can see actually peregrine numbers have fared a lot better generally, certainly during the noughties, although in recent, the last decade or so, numbers have started to go down. And that again is thought to be related to what's going on in Northern England. What's going on in Northern England and Scotland? Well, there's a number of different things going on. You do have uh, some intensively managed moorlands and upland areas, which are managed for red grouse that you can see in the top left hand corner there. But the, the result of managing this habitat very heavy, and burning it and managing it just for grouse, means that while some birds benefit and on some managed grouse walls, you might get more wading birds. And um, generally what you do get uh, in some places by some people um, is illegal persecution. And you can see here on the photograph in the bottom right hand corner, we can see a, a dead peregrine that's been poisoned. But also in this very intensively managed area, particularly in parts of Scotland, you've also got over browsing from deer. So you're not having any bushes and trees growing. Uh, you've got a lot of grazing by sheep and browsing by deer. And that's meaning that the habitat is is not in the best quality for both invertebrates and insects, for example, plant life and in turn birds. So the sorts of birds that um, will come to those, the sorts of birds that you might expect peregrines to be eating in these areas are things such as skylarks, golden plovers, lapwings and meadow pipits. And all these birds, one way or another, are showing declines in these places. This is the breeding bird survey results between 1995 and 2018 for Scotland. Um, and, you know, there's, there's over half the number of lapwings. And those are actually a really 
meaty bite-sized meal for a peregrine that might well be living in a rural part of northern England or Scotland. And while the other three species haven't necessarily declined as dramatically, the numbers have still gone down. So in essence, really, in parts of northern England and Scotland, there's less good habitat, uh, there's less prey species for the peregrine. And on top of that, there's also illegal persecution going on. And some of that is also fueled both from perhaps gamekeepers, uh, rogue gamekeepers, I must add there, and also sometimes rogue pigeon fanciers who obviously are not happy about peregrines eating uh, perhaps their racing birds and will sometimes put out laced pigeons or um, poisons that, that, that mean the peregrines actually die and might also bring that food back to their, their nests, for example. So I think it's important just to be aware of that bigger picture that, that while I want to celebrate peregrines tonight, and, and, and certainly they're doing very well in urban locations, we must just think about the bigger picture across the UK. And particularly when we, we hear a lot about um, nature recovery and thinking about nature recovery networks and things like that, um, certainly lots more needs to be done in terms of the food that these birds eat uh, and, and, and making sure that these prey species are doing well. But if we come back to uh, England, and certainly sort of southern England, really, we come back to our peregrine I showed you earlier. And what's really interesting is that when you um, read stories by people such as a guy called Dick Trelevin, who was a person who studied peregrines on coastal Cornwall um, back in the sort of 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and beyond into the 80s and 90s, then actually peregrines during that period were very much coastal birds uh, or birds of upland areas. And then when they recovered from the effects of pesticides in the 1980s, they not only came back to those coastal haunts, those upland haunts, they started to come into inland quarries and they started to come into towns and cities much more. There's occasional records of peregrines during the 1800s using St Paul's Cathedral, Salisbury Cathedral, but not on a regular basis that we see today. My theory on this is that many of these rural locations became saturated by peregrine pairs, and because they were much better protected in the 1980s onwards, thanks to the Wildlife and Countryside Act uh, of 1981, then actually peregrines weren't under the same pressure. They weren't being shot because they were eating carrier pigeons. They weren't being poisoned in the same way that they were. They weren't being shot for taxidermy. So the pressure has meant peregrines have come back to those former haunts and then more so. And of course, as these urban locations have become saturated, particularly here in the West Country, where I am in Gloucestershire and further west, then they've been able to move more into other parts of uh, the country. And I'll talk about that in a little while. So here we have some very sweet uh, little chicks. These have just hatched. These are actually in the Avon Gorge in Bristol, uh, kind of replicating this idea of these birds being very kind of rural birds. These are in a natural uh, cliff ledge. Uh, they don't really make a nest out of nest material. They're just using kind of rock debris here. There's a few bones and discarded pellets and things like that from where the birds have been feeding. And I kind of often see the Avon Gorge in Bristol as a bit of a kind of interface really between rural peregrines and urban peregrines because of any of you that might know Bristol at all, the Avon Gorge is literally about three miles from the centre of Bristol, it's got a busy road beneath it, the portway, and it's very easy for these birds to both use an urban and a rural environment and for me this photograph very much sums up that, that kind of story really. And so as peregrines have done well, uh, they've frequented lots of different buildings. And you often find them on buildings such as cathedrals and churches. This is Clandath Cathedral in Cardiff, for example, many of which perhaps to the peregrine resemble some of those natural cliff faces that you see along the coastline and in upland areas, for example. Many of these buildings are often made out of sandstone and limestone, exactly the same sorts of materials. They've got nooks and crannies and crevices and ledges that you might expect in these quarries, even though to you and I, they obviously look <laughs> different. They've got architecture to them. But we do also see peregrines on concrete office blocks as well. So there's obviously more to it than just it simply being made out of the same sort of material. But one of the important things, and again, this is from this is from Clandath Cathedral in Cardiff, looking towards Cardiff city centre, is the fact that these spaces offer the birds height, they offer them refuge, 
But they also offer them this amazing bird's eye view across their, their kind of landscape, really, where they're feeding, where they're looking for prey species, particularly pigeons, but lots of other species as well, which I'll talk about as we as we move on this evening. But I think it's important to get into the peregrine's world and realise that actually up on top of a spire like this, these are the sorts of view you get as a peregrine. You're above the trees, you're above the buildings, you're able to scan the wider environment. Uh, and that is obviously important for the peregrine, which is one of our fastest birds. They can fly pretty fast in a stoop dive, maybe 150 miles. They have been thought to reach up to 200 miles, but generally lower speeds than that when they pull back their wings, almost bullet shaped, and they drop out of the air towards their prey. And what's very interesting actually about urban peregrines, I think, is that we've probably been able to observe more about urban dwelling peregrines in the last 20 years than we ever have been before. If we go back to before the 1980s, when these were very much rare birds, they were often in uh, remote coastal places and upland areas where perhaps you needed to be several kilometers away with a telescope to watch them under a license. Then actually it was really for those dedicated peregrine watchers to watch these birds and get some really interesting information about them. But as peregrines have ventured into our towns and cities, they've actually quite happily, they quite happily sit on buildings um, 20, 30 meters away from people walking below. And you don't need a license to obviously be near them. You're not necessarily disturbing them. You're just walking by and you can stop by and watch them and look at them and so forth. And so peregrines actually in urban locations give us a really intimate insight into what they do and into their behaviour, as you can see here with this pair, uh, which are mating on top of a very tall office block in, in Bristol, for example. And they're very much at home on other kind of maybe what we might class as kind of urban junk. Uh, in this case, we've got a peregrine perched on some communication towers. But as far as the peregrine's concerned, it's a really good kind of perching point where it can rest and, and look out for prey. And this is one of my favourite photographs, actually, this was taken a while ago now, but there was a surveyor on top of Derby Cathedral, uh, looked over and saw this male peregrine on one of his favourite perches. And what I love about this actually is that you can just see uh, one or two people just walking below on the right hand side there. But this is very much the peregrine's world. And if you ever get to go on a roof in a city or a town, it's incredibly quiet up there, actually. I've been on top lots of roofs to help um, put bands or rings on baby gulls, seagulls. And um, it's a very quiet place. It's amazing how undisturbed it is, despite all the busy and hustling, bustling activity that's going on at ground level. But also from my perspective, as someone who's looked at what peregrines, urban dwelling peregrines eat, um, it gives you a sense of how we can find their prey remains because a bird like this will be plucking uh, maybe a pigeon or a duck or something like that. And you can see how easily actually the feathers fall below alongside bits of wings and skulls and legs and things like that. You can also appreciate that if it's a bit breezy, many of these feathers float away a much further distance away. And you can sometimes find feathers from peregrine prey, you know, 50 to 100 meters away from, from these locations where they've been blown by the wind. Now, one thing that was very interesting, I guess, was that Peregrine started to kind of recover in numbers, particularly during the 1980s. And this happened not just in Britain, but also across Western Europe, particularly, perhaps a little bit of a time lag in Eastern Europe and also across North America, where birds were reintroduced. And actually, incidentally, some birds have been reintroduced across parts, some parts of um, Europe, including Sweden, for example, and Poland. But one thing that we were, were starting to see was that Peregrine started to come into urban locations, particularly in the West Country. So like a lot of birds, ravens, buzzards, red kites and peregrines, many of these birds suffered persecution. They suffered lots of different things. And many of them were pushed back often to the Western parts of Wales and, and, and Southwest England. And as they've recovered, they, the first places they've come to obviously have been places like Bristol and Bath before they've gradually radiated out further. And so many of these birds were starting to take up churches and buildings in places like Bath and Bristol, often they go through something called a pattern of urbanisation, which is a, a, a kind of model that's been developed in Italy, really, from observing peregrines. But you may have started to see this in some of your urban locations in Essex, is that you get one bird often frequenting a church or a building, and perhaps six months or a year later, you might get another bird join it. 
but they may only been there maybe between July uh, and April. And then for some reason they seem to disappear kind of May, June, July time, and then, then they return. And then they, or, or maybe different individual birds that have come back to the same building, start to show signs of courtship and display. They may be chasing each other, calling to each other, maybe even mating. And we have found it in some locations, peregrines will, will actually try laying eggs, often into the gutters or the flat kind of lead roofs of, of buildings, such as churches. Um, but unfortunately, their eggs will often roll into the gutters and get wet and, and not hatch. So one of the reasons peregrines have done very well in urban locations over the last 20 years is that people um, have intelligently, I'd, I'd say on the whole, been putting nest trays, nest boxes up where you've got some substrate such as gravel where the peregrines can lay their eggs into, they've got a bit of shelter. Um, there was a time, I think, when there was almost boxes going up everywhere, which wasn't very helpful, even though it gave perhaps companies and organisation green credentials, but it does need a little bit of thought um, about where and when boxes go up and, and sometimes also where, because if peregrines aren't all, already somewhere, then, for example, the racing pigeon community can get quite upset that perhaps we're trying to bring pe peregrines in. Whereas it's a little bit more accepted if peregrines are already on a building, perhaps they're already laying eggs and they just need a little bit more of a helping hand. So we do have to be a little bit careful. So this one here is in Bristol. This one here is on Clandath Cathedral, for example. Um, and as long as they've got this substrate, they've got somewhere for their eggs to be laid into. And uh, generally, they can be very, very happy bunnies. And these are the results. The fabulous thing is, is that also with these urban locations, um, we can put cameras in. And cameras these days are very high definition. There's various ways in which we can transmit the information. We can either send it just to a network video recorder where you can get clips off and put them onto YouTube. Uh, you can transmit live footage onto YouTube and other places um, through the broadband of a building where they might be nesting, or you can do it through a special modem and actually getting it going out across the, the mobile network. And this particular image here actually comes from, from Cheltenham, where exactly what I've described to you was going on there. Eggs were rolling into the gutter and they needed a helping hand. And you can see here uh, just the wonderful kind of footage, really, the intimacy of the bird. These are, these are very young chicks that have just hatched uh, it's a number of years ago now. You can see the hatched egg on the left hand side. But also, you, hopefully, you can see just how gentle the female is being here with her talons. If you look there, she's scrunching her talons up to make sure she doesn't um, puncture or, or grasp any of the chicks. It does happen with inexperienced peregrines. They do sometimes uh, become a bit clumsy with their talons. And, and we have seen youngsters squashed or punctured or even go overboard uh, a nest sometimes where, where inexperienced adults are not being so careful. So this comes with experience very often, this, this um, intelligence, I guess, of being soft and delicate and careful with the talons when they are um, with their chicks. And here you can see those exact youngsters um, a couple of weeks later growing up in their second coat of down. And the parent here giving them a little bit of shelter from some quite hot sunshine uh, in, in kind of mid-May. So I'm gonna actually come a little bit closer to Essex as I'm sort of, again, bringing, in, bringing the peregrines into the kind of picture in the story really. But I'm gonna talk a bit more about this in a moment about where they're spreading and how they're spreading. But certainly in recent years, we're now seeing them in sort of Hertfordshire, obviously coming over towards Essex and Suffolk and Norfolk and what have you. And these were some young chicks actually very recently um, from a building in Welling Garden City here, looking very healthy, uh, almost close to fledging. Um, but, you know, what a brilliant sight. And I, what's really interesting is talking to people such as yourselves in Essex and Hertfordshire um, and Norfolk and Suffolk and seeing kind of what was happening over here in the West Country 20 years ago now happening in the Eastern counties. So it's an exciting time for you all. Um, as peregrines are more and more coming into towns and cities and, and uh, using different man-made buildings. And here you can see three chicks also at Welling Garden City in their nest tray here. Um, just over a couple of weeks old, probably about two and a half weeks old here, maybe closer to three weeks. They're just getting their wing feathers coming out of their pins and they've been ringed. We generally recommend ringing them around about 19, 20, 21 days when their leg bones are big enough to take the rings without the rings going over their toes. Um, but they're not so big that they're going to be sort of scootling off anywhere. So these are a perfect age for ringing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So let's come to, let's think a little bit about Essex then. Um, 
obviously over towards the eastern side of England with some very big um, locations here, Colchester, Chelmsford, Southend on Sea, Basildon, for example, but also quite a lot of sort of rural areas and smaller towns as well. Um, and so from an urban peregrine perspective, they're obviously going to be going for these larger towns and cities and, uh, you know, places where you've got big bridges, where you've got ports and docks uh, with buildings and cranes, for example, and of course also lots of prey. And in the more rural parts of Essex, peregrines are going to be looking for places such as pylons and bridges uh, more so. Um, although peregrines do sometimes nest in trees and on the ground, on the ground has tended to be much more in Scotland in the past and sometimes on uh, high tide lines down in Hampshire, for example, and, and sometimes in trees in southern England, but, but more so it's going to be things like um, um, pylons, for example. So the sorts of places where we're going to find them, and uh, hopefully Michael might be listening tonight, but Michael Papmore has very much been watching these birds, monitoring these birds and helping to make sure that their welfare is taken care of as um, as the Jumbo Water Tower has, has works done to it. But this is certainly where peregrines have been nesting over the last number of years or so. And Matt sent me some beautiful photographs today actually of peregrines from uh, across Essex and some of the other sort of well-known public known places where peregrines are frequenting are places such as Abbotton Reservoir, which is um, sort of three or four miles or so from Colchester, probably where some of these birds from Colchester are going actually to feed. We've got them at, um, at Thurrock, uh, Essex Wildlife Trust Reserve, Old Hall Marshes, where I think they breed on Bradwell Power Station and also in Felixstowe docks. And in 2020, um, Michael was able to check for me in the 2020 Essex um, bird report, there were 20 uh, breeding pairs of peregrines across Essex, raising between them 24 young, and there were three non-breeding pairs as well. So pairs that, you know, have the potential to breed, may have even attempted to breed, but didn't have chicks. So that's pretty good that there's there's 10, certainly in 2020, there were 10 um, breeding pairs of peregrines. So here we've got a couple of the chicks here. Again, these are probably about getting on towards four weeks old. They're starting to lose their white down here and starting to show through their um, browner plumage. And you can see the white markings birds of prey such as owls and peregrines and uh, but you know hawks tend to have very white watery poo and when they're youngsters like this they don't want their nest location to be really mucky and smelly so they tend to squirt their bottoms out towards the light and uh, you end up with these white streaks which can be a good way of knowing perhaps where a nest um, actually is located so these are some beautiful photographs that Max has taken of, of peregrines in Essex. And very often you're going to be looking for them on the tops of gutters. In this case, you've got them on top of um, some metalwork here, um, but usually on very prominent places. But it's amazing how their grey plumage, and in the case of youngsters, their brown plumage, can actually make them very well camouflaged against these, these sorts of locations from a distance. Here's a more rural uh, bird. I was always told or, or, or I guess given tips as a kid when I used to go out bird watching to always look at fence posts when you're out in the countryside and fence posts are really great places for looking for sparrowhawks, merlins, kestrels and also peregrines. So if you are out at some of these places such as Aberton Reservoir, look on the pylons but also look on the fence posts, look on the ground, look on logs. These are all good places for spotting peregrines and Although I'm talking a lot about urban dwelling peregrines today, um, this bird here could well be an urban dwelling peregrine that's choosing to actually be out in the countryside to feed, um, where it may either eat its food in the countryside or bring that prey um, back to an urban location. And here we've got a fantastic bridge location. And if you look on the right hand side, hopefully you can just see the peregrine perched on the right hand side. And we see this a lot also here over in the West Country, particularly on the Seven Bridges, the old Seven Bridge, the M48 Bridge and then the Prince of Wales Bridge. Um, this is often where peregrines are going to be perching just on um, strategic kind of posts underneath these bridges very often. And if you're lucky driving over, you sometimes see them flying over the bridge as well. So I hope that just gives you a little bit of a context then, some nice pictures of, of peregrines that are actually over in Essex. And what I want to talk to you a bit now with the story of urban peregrines is 
well, you know, where have some of these birds come from um, and, and what is actually going on in terms of, you know, what, what perhaps is the future of peregrines in Essex? And to do that, um, we have to come back here to the West Country. And here is me with a young peregrine, just over three weeks old. And what I'm doing here is, is ringing this bird. And what we do is we put um, a metal ring, a unique metal ring that's issued by the British Trust for Ornithology, all done under a Schedule 1 licence, which is a special licence allowing us to disturb peregrines at the nest during the breeding season. So we put a metal ring on the right leg and we put a colour ring on the left leg. And the colour ring in my case is blue with two black letters or white letters. But in other parts of the country, you may see other colours used. Down in Sussex, for example, they use green and black. Uh, I think around the Isle of Sheppey, they've used black in the past. And up in northern England, they use red. And around Shropshire, they've used white. So there's lots of different colour schemes, but uh, the only blue ones have been used in the West Country, which makes it nice to know, you know, if you see a blue bird, blue ringed bird, you know it's going to be one from over this way. And what we do is we ring these birds and then we wait. Um, we wait for people to spot these birds when they are either breeding or when they are moving around the countryside. And the fantastic thing is, is that with digital te technology, both in terms of people's own cameras, but also web cameras, um, these ringed birds get picked up um, and spotted by people both alive, um, but also sometimes dead as well, of course, where these birds get injured or, or they die when they, for example, hit power lines. So this is a young peregrine here from the Avon Gorge with the DF on it on its left leg there. Um, these birds are only out of the nest for about 20 minutes or half an hour. And we work very closely with the British Mountaineering Council um, to get these chicks. Uh, obviously, if we're in a building, it's much, much easier generally to get to the chicks. You go up usually through locked doors and upstairs and things, but it's much easier than uh, going down a cliff. And the wonderful thing about the colouring in is that it, it is very effective. Um, we certainly know from urban goals, for example, that if you put just a metal ring on the bird, you know, if you're lucky, you might hear from five, 10 percent of those birds, if that probably a much smaller number, maybe even two, three, four, five percent. As soon as you put colour rings on, you actually hear back from 60 to 80 percent of these birds. It's a much, much higher um, rate of, of comeback. And the same sort of thing with peregrines, actually. It's not necessarily quite as high as gulls because Obviously, gulls are very gregarious. Peregrines are less so. Peregrines can disappear off into kind of rural locations and not be seen for a while, if at all. So, but nonetheless, this bird here tells an interesting story because actually this was the first peregrine that we ringed back in 2007. Um, he was one of two, him and his sister. And the interesting story here is that, he, well, he lived to 13, actually. He died two years ago. He lived up to the age of 13. But what was interesting is that in his first year of life, he stayed with his mum and dad. And in 2008, his mum laid some eggs, but his dad disappeared before the eggs hatched. And so he actually stayed on and helped his mum rear those, those chicks that hatched. Now, his mum wasn't ringed, so we don't know for sure what happened after those years, but we're pretty sure that certainly for two or three years afterwards, maybe more, he actually stayed with his mum and, and actually mated with his mum and had some youngsters with her. And believe it or not, genetic studies do show actually that this kind of incest in birds of prey is more common um, than you might imagine. Although birds of prey generally do have mechanisms to try and avoid this. And females generally will move further afield than males to, to make sure that they're not mating with um, similar genetics. But anyway, she did finally die or disappear. And actually over that 13 years, this male bird did in fact mate with other females and uh, successfully reared, you know, lots and lots of different chicks uh, until his demise about three years ago. And he was found dead on, on top of a roof uh, in Bath. What happened to him, we're not sure. Um, by the time he was found, he was already sort of quite well decomposed and kind of mummified really. But I'd like to think perhaps maybe he just got to an old age. They can live up to the ages of 17. And in Scotland, they've even had a bird that was recorded at 23 years old. <coughs> but on the whole, 13 is a good average age, perhaps even more, more you know, older than the average, really, age of, of, a, of a peregrine. And this is all thanks to these colour rings, basically. Um, so, for example, we also have these two birds here. So this, these are the first example of birds, um, peregrine chicks, that have actually mated together. So one of them was hatched in Exeter, one was hatched in Bath, both in 2015, and then two years later they were found 
um, together in their adult plumages and they've been together ever since, so since 2017. And uh, these are the first example of a pair where we know both their origins, um, which is really exciting. It's great to sort of know who these birds are and a bit more about their life history. And it's also great because when you're engaging uh, the public and people such as yourselves, um, these become characters. They become characters that tell stories. And obviously that's a great way of getting people to love peregrines, love birds, um, and to want to know and find out more uh, about them. Now today was a very exciting day because I had a paper published, um, a scientific paper that was published in a journal called Ringing in Migration, which is a journal that the British Trust for Ornithology published. And it was all about uh, the ringing recovery. So I, I, over the last, since 2007, I've been working with a team of people, the British Mountaineering Council, lots of other ringers. And as a team, we've been ringing uh, lots and lots of peregrines, over 300 peregrines over the last um, 14 years or so, 15 years. And as part of a master's project four years ago now, I number crunched and did analyses on reco these recoveries. And we've had we've heard back from 66 birds, 66 peregrines, where we bring them as chicks. And these are the places where they, they have actually gone to. Um, so we've got you can see, obviously, we've got a little bit of a cluster down here in Devon where we bring some birds. We've got a few down in Dorset, but the majority of these birds that we bring have been in Gloucestershire and around sort of Bristol and Bath. So you can see lots of these birds are heading north. Some of these birds are heading over your way. So a couple around here, for example, around kind of Hatfield area, Rye Meads area in Hertfordshire. We've got this bird here, which was um, known as GA. She went all the way over towards Norwich. And we have had one or two blue birds, blue ring birds head over towards Suffolk as well. But, but I don't think we've been able to identify their colour rings. We've also had a few spotted in Wales, but again, we've not necessarily been able to read their rings. And what you have to remember with this map is that obviously the majority of people live around these areas. So it's quite possible that our blue ringed birds are going into central parts of Wales, but these are very remote, they're very mountainous. And so if pairs of peregrines are nesting here, it's very unlikely that their rings will be spotted or red. Um, but nonetheless, this is very exciting. And I want to also just show you here because we currently have a male bird that was ringed in Salisbury and he's currently with a female uh, on Guernsey. And he's been there for the last uh, year or so, which is really exciting. We also had a bird that went to the Isle of Wight. Now, if we come back to Essex, um, there's a few interesting things to talk about Essex, really. But the breeding female that you've got in Colchester, she actually has come over from the Netherlands, from the Maastricht um, part of the Netherlands. And... What you have to remember, of course, is that for the peregrine falcons, the British Isles is just an island. You know, they can easily sort of make the journey uh, across the North Sea and across the Channel uh, without any problem, really. It's a hop, skip and a jump for a peregrine. And actually, when you look at Danish peregrines, when you look at German peregrines and Polish peregrines, there's lots of movements between all of them, crossing the Baltic Sea and, and moving between them. So this is not necessarily... Um, that surprising but nonetheless it's still a, a great record and generally when we do see Dutch and Flemish birds breeding in the UK it genuinely tends to be on the in those eastern counties Essex and um, Suffolk particularly so this is exciting to know though that um, you know your breeding female in Colchester uh, was a chicken 2015 she started breeding uh, I think around about two three years old and that's quite early but we do see a lot more young peregrines particularly in a growing population like we have in Essex um, where, where birds might actually start to nest a little bit earlier they might nest in their second year rather than third year but generally most peregrines are nest going to nest when they're about females genuinely when they're about three three years old but other birds that we've heard from include uh, this bird for example this one was actually a rural um, ringed bird in Devon and she turned up actually eating a puffin on Scotcombe Island a couple of years later of all places and this bird here uh, gives us some particularly interesting insights um, here it is as a chick in the top right hand corner RY um, here she is feeding on a pigeon on the top right 
And then actually on the bottom picture here, she's dead, sadly. If you look at the writing on the bottle on the left, you'll see that that's not obviously British writing. It's uh, Arabic. So this is um, this bird actually, believe it or not, made it all the way uh, to Morocco. And it's almost the furthest um, where, furthest distance that a peregrine has travelled um, from the UK. There has been another one that's managed to get to the Canary Islands um, just a little bit further, uh, and I think made it just over 3,000 kilometres. But this peregrine made it all the way to Morocco. It was found dead, sadly, in the town. We're not quite sure whether it was ship assisted or whether it actually made this journey all by itself. And it's a bit of an unusual recovery. Most peregrines don't tend to do this. So it's quite interesting that this bird did. I just want to go back a moment. Um, just want to show you this bird that I mentioned to you that went from Salisbury all the way to Guernsey. So you can see the journey that this particular bird has done here. And you can see the bird there with a the blue ring on the left hand side on the rocks on the coasts of Guernsey. So this is an urban bird that has become an island bird, a coastal bird. Now, generally on the whole, we tend to find that urban birds remain urban birds throughout their lifetime and coastal birds remain coastal birds and so forth. But there is some switching around. Um, and so in this case, this bird has obviously decided to go south. It's gone to Guernsey, it's found a female and so forth. Now, one thing I must add in here is that female peregrines generally move further afield than males. So a lot of those, if I go back to my map a minute up here, a lot of these long recoveries, particularly ones up towards Leeds, for example, and, and Norfolk tend to be females. They're generally traveling 150, 200, maybe even 300 uh, kilometers away from where they hatched, whereas the male birds tend to stay closer to home, perhaps not traveling more than 25, 30 kilometers, although some will travel more than that, over 100, 150. And obviously, as we see, some of those males will also travel to places such as uh, the Guernsey Islands and what ha Guernsey. And I think what's also interesting about this map also is the direction. So generally, these birds are moving in a kind of northeast direction. And what I think is going, what we think is going on here is that they're kind of almost leapfrogging. They're, they, they're going into the Midlands. They're going into the eastern counties. They're finding peregrines already there. And so they're carrying on further afield. And I think that's what's going to be happening across um, Essex over the coming years, is that more peregrines are going to be jumping across the central counties, including Berkshire and Hertfordshire, and they're going to be um, bumping their way along into Essex and Suffolk uh, and increasing numbers in those particular counties. Um, males tend to set up territory and then the females go looking for males on territory. So generally what you're going to be having going on is, is perhaps you might have females on territory, but generally you're going to be having males setting up first and females coming to find those males. And just to show you that, that some of these eastern birds don't always just stay in the eastern counties. Um, this was a young bird a little bit earlier in the year. Um, it was actually ringed in Finland six months earlier, and it was spotted wintering down in Devon. And we've seen the same actually on the Somerset levels, where we've also had birds on the Somerset levels that have come from Sweden. So although we might get maybe breeding birds mainly on, in the eastern counties, such as Essex, in the winter time, we can get Scandinavian peregrines uh, actually going heading all the way down into southwest England. So I hope that that first half of the presentation there has given you a really nice understanding really of where peregrines were at, particularly thinking in terms of rural peregrines, where they've come and you know why perhaps is that we've now got peregrines in urban locations. It's to do with this idea that you've got territories becoming saturated, You've got male birds looking for new territories, females moving further afield to make sure they're not inbreeding. And so you're getting this kind of spread. And if anything, it also mirrors the spread of birds such as ravens and buzzards into all the eastern counties. Again, these birds are being pushed further and further east as territories in the west and the kind of central and southern counties are becoming uh, saturated which is great news for you guys because it means more peregrines to spot and uh, you know more of these wonderful birds to see and the reason peregrines obviously are doing successful across these places is not only because they're protected and they're being protected from persecution um it's because there's places for them to nest but also importantly there's food for them to eat and when I first became interested in peregrines 24 years ago now, 25 years ago, 
I was originally very interested in what it was they were eating because I used to collect skulls and feathers as a kid. And I was fascinated that peregrines were eating things I didn't have in my collection. So that kind of, that's what got me really hooked. And then I started to realize that they weren't just eating pigeons and that actually there was an interesting story to be told here, which is what I'm going to explain a little bit more about uh, in this, this sort of second half or so. I love this very intimate shot. Here we've got a, a, an adult peregrine here feeding. It's very well grown chick. This chick is pretty much ready to uh, fledge. And actually, it also gives me a great opportunity just for you to see uh, the difference between the adult on the left and the youngster on the right there. You can see the youngster's got bluey grey skin instead of the yellow skin. It's got a much more sort of dark, chocolatey brown plumage. And rather than it having kind of markings that go across the breast and the chest, it's got um, sort of more arrow shaped markings that go down the breast across quite a sort of pinky creamy colour of the breast, so quite different to the adult and keeps them very, very cryptic and camouflaged against um, uh, rocky, natural rocky structures. And here we've got some in Taunton. Uh, we've got a single chick on the bottom there and it's transformation into this very big chick on the top right there and uh, the parent here giving, giving it some, some food. And here we've got uh, another bird here, actually, with a swift, um, which it was uh, plucking to, to feed its chick. So over the last 24 years or so, one of my specialist areas has been to identify the prey remains of peregrines. Skulls, wings, legs tend to be reasonably easy, but it's also about being able to identify some of the smaller, more intricate feathers um, from peregrines. I'm not sure if you might recognise any of these feathers here. There's not really many pigeon feathers. There's a couple just here on the right hand side. But most of these actually are other prey items, which are what got me really hooked on peregrines in the first place. There's a green finch feather at the top with the yellow. Most of these stripy feathers and spotty feathers here are from teal duck, which is a nice hand sized duck for peregrines to catch. In the middle here, we've got a yellow and brown feather, which is from a golden plover. We've got some snipe feathers. On the top here, we've got this lovely banded tail feather here, secondary feather, wing feather from a snipe here. And then we've got some woodcock tail feathers on the top right, this beautiful white tip and these barred feathers down here on the bottom. And this is an example of any urban location, including somewhere like Chelmsford or, or Colchester, where peregrines will pluck their prey and bring it down. But importantly for the story I'm telling tonight, these are not just pigeon. And this what got me really hooked in peregrines is the fact that they weren't simply eating pigeons in an urban environment. They were eating prey species that I would never see in the middle of a city. And so were the peregrines heading out to the countryside to catch these birds? Or were these birds perhaps passing over the towns and cities and being intercepted by the peregrines? And that was this, this question that's kind of stayed with me ever since. Well, over the last 20 years or so, I've built up a fabulous database. I've worked with people such as Nick Dixon, who sends me bags of feathers and wings and skulls from Exeter, for example. And I now have a database that's got data from over 100 urban locations, about 120 urban locations across the UK, covering about 140 prey species, most of which are birds. There's a few mammals in there, such as um, the old bat, uh, and rat, but actually most of those 140 are bird species. The majority of which are native bird species, there's about three or four kind of cage bird species in there as well. Now, I've mentioned pigeons, and peregrines certainly do eat pigeons. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes, as you can see here in this picture. And so part of the task is obviously trying to work out how many you've got. And when I'm presented with the feathers of pigeons, I'm often looking for the outer wing feathers. I'm looking for different color feathers. But you have to be careful because some of these dark gray pigeons can have white wing feathers. And so you could easily think there was two pigeons when there's just one. So it's a careful uh, sort, sort, sorting through the prey remains to work out who you've got. And feral pigeons and loft pigeons, obviously birds that might well be racing pigeons, for example, generally, they make up about a third to half of the urban peregrine's diet. So that's still a significant proportion. A single species makes up a third to a half of the urban peregrine's diet. And so whether they're in Felixstowe docks, whether, in, whether, whether they are in um, Colchester, couldn't remember the name, <laughs> whether they're in Colchester, there's generally a ready supply 
of feral pigeons around, whether they're using warehouses or churches or what have you. So there's a good ready supply. But, you know, pigeons aren't that easy to catch. They do require a lot of energy. They require speed. They require um, sometimes the element of surprise because, of course, the pigeons don't want to be caught themselves. They in themselves have evolved pointy wings, fast speed to be able to evade peregrine falcons. So what else do they eat? Well, we have found that they eat a lot of starlings, not so much at this time of the year, but my PhD is revealing that starlings are very important during the breeding season. So since COVID, um, during the lockdowns, I took advantage of the fact that there was lots of people at home and we tapped into uh, lots of postgraduate research students who were wanting a distraction. And we ended up managing to study up to 30 web cameras, urban web cameras across the UK, where we were recording every single prey species, every single prey item that came into urban locations. And to my surprise, starlings were really important as a prey species. Peregrines obviously have to catch more of them to make up for the same amount of meat as you'd get on a pigeon. But nonetheless, they are still very important. And it appears that they're very important, particularly during the early part of the breeding season when those chicks are quite small and pigeons become perhaps more dominant later in the nesting season. But what's interested me most are the other species that peregrines are eating as well. The stories that these prey species to tell, it's not just about the peregrine. Peregrines eating these other birds is telling us a story about what's going on in our local environment with these other species. So in October, November, and particularly February, March time, red wings are very important in the diet and, and to a lesser degree field fares. But red wings are very visual. They go around in loose flocks. They don't fly particularly fast. So peregrines take advantage of them. They bring back teal duck in almost every urban location, whether it's a bang in the middle of the city or in a town, teal duck are, are taken um, in variable numbers, but they are a common prey item. Golden plovers on the bottom left there, when they leave their northern uh, upland areas where they breed and they come down into southern counties, they are also a, a common prey species along with lapwing. And if you live in the greater London area in the home counties, ringneck parakeets are also a very important prey item, sometimes actually the second or th third most common prey item for some locations, which is a delight to some people in the London area. Um, but I like parakeets, but not everybody likes them, so they're quite delightful. But, but actually, you know, they are exotic birds. Um, they are present in very big numbers now. We don't really know the full extent um, or impact that they have on our native species. But it is interesting to know that, that, that certainly peregrines prey on them in a, in a big way. And what I want to, um, oh, I hope this is gonna work. Yeah, I'm just gonna show you some um, video footage. Hopefully it's gonna play for me okay, um, of how we actually get some of this, this data. And these are some of the prey clips. And I'm hoping there's gonna be enough memory here for it to play, let's see. So what's happening here is we've got a web camera. This is at Wakefield. And before the eggs have hatched here, I think the might be one just hatching actually, just behind the uh, per female peregrine's bottom there, the male is bringing in prey. And in this case, he's bringing in a very well plucked starling. So I've got very good at identifying very well plucked prey items, particularly starlings. Um, so during the first, um, so, so prior to hatching and during certainly during the first two weeks or so of the hatching the male will be bringing the prey and handing over the prey to the female now if you've got more established experienced pairs or the female's quite young and the male's more experienced the male may actually muscle in there and do more of the feeds but generally um, you tend to find the females doing the feeding of the chicks in the first few weeks or so but the male is doing most of the hunting um, sometimes you get the odd male that doesn't seem to be very good or very interested in hunting as much and the female is often forced sometimes into going out hunting herself but it, it can be variable between pairs 
Now, the next one's a little bit less noisy. I hope it's going to work right. So this is actually in Kingston, and this is showing you the young birds here with uh, ringneck parakeets. So you can hear that, you can see that from the perspective of monitoring these birds, it's a very distinctive species. And obviously we have to be very careful not to be biased at just noticing only the colorful birds. So obviously we're, we're identifying all the prey species, including the starling um, and the, the feral pigeons. This one's probably very obvious to you. It's a common woodland bird now and taken in quite big numbers by peregrines. Here's a great spotted woodpecker. They're not always as easy as this to identify though. And as I say, very often these prey species come in um, so well plucked that um, we do sometimes have to identify them as just to, to, a, to a size um, number. Um, and also just to show you here that, you know, even when perhaps the footage isn't, isn't as good, we still have the ability to be able to identify prey. So this is in Sheffield, for example, where it's not quite as high definition, but we are still able to identify things such as starlings coming into be fed. So here's the female bringing in a starling. It's a juvenile starling. And there it has been taken. It's just got a very pale chest there. So we've got very good at being able to identify these different species, but it, but it is building up a picture of what urban peregrines are feeding their chicks on. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's important because peregrines are still persecuted because of assumptions about what they eat not so much in urban locations, but certainly in rural places. And the more we know about any sort of species, the better informed we are, and the better the decisions can be made on the conservation of these birds. Or, you know, if people are saying that there's a problem with peregrines, well, if the science is saying, well, actually there isn't, or they're not actually eating what you're saying they're eating, then that's really important in terms of the conservation and the protection of a species. So it's really important that we do know. It's also important we know, obviously, the effect that these birds might be having on their prey species and whether they um, are changing their diet in accordance to the changing populations of birds and things like that. And that's what my PhD is looking at and going to be looking at, how the peregrine diet has changed over the last 20 years, how it's changed in relation to changing bird populations and, and things like that. And uh, don't worry about the detail on this picture, but it's just to show I've been working with Brandon Mack, who's at King's College London, who's been looking at um, urban peregrines from a more sort of social, uh, geographical sort of perspective. And thanks to all of this kind of web camera work that we've been doing over the lockdowns and, and also this year, we built up a really nice picture of what <clears throat> the top three prey species, I guess, are in different locations. And I can just, you can see here that we've got places all over the country. We've got two over here in Norfolk, um, or three actually, we've got Norwich, Cantley and Cromer, for example. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see actually that in somewhere like Sheffield, feral pigeons actually make up about 40% of the diet during the breeding season, racing pigeons about 37%, and starlings are close to 10%. Um, interesting enough, though, in Wakefield, we see lots of start, well, lots of chaffinches being taken, almost 8%. In Nottingham, again, feral pigeons, followed by a smaller number of racing pigeons and starlings. And then if we look in the southern counties, we see things are slightly different. If we go over to Salisbury on the bottom left, for example, starlings make up 58% of the diet. Now, this is by number, not biomass, I must add, not, not by their weight, but it's still interesting nonetheless. Swifts are 9% and feral pigeons 8%. So it's really quite variable what these birds are eating. If we look at Chichester, again, 67% of the diet is starling. Feral pigeons are only 12% of the diet and 9% are swifts. And in Brighton, terns make up 10% of the diet. And in Kingston, parakeets make up 13% of the diet. So hopefully this shows you that, that actually the diets of urban peregrines during the breeding season is variable. It does differ depending on where you are in the country. And I'm going to be number crunching these things to look at how the diet does change over the course of the breeding season and perhaps why and how starlings are important and things like that. But it shows you that despite the starling being a red data species and having declined a lot due to, well, probably things to do with intensification of farming, etc., uh, and also the tiling up of our roofs and houses for nesting, they do actually, they are an important prey species for the peregrine. And it's all well thinking, well, if there's less starlings, they'll probably just eat more pigeons or something else. But we can never assume that. And I think we have to be careful at, at, at not just assuming that that um, that will happen. And we certainly know that in the Welsh valleys, for example, where racing pigeon routes have been diverted, um, 
nesting peregrines are not doing very well at all. If anything, they're not really breed having any breeding success. And actually, probably thanks to racing pigeons, peregrines in the in the Welsh valleys were actually probably elevated and doing much better than they would otherwise do. Coming closer to home, this is some of the prey that Michael Padmore has sent me from Colchester. And uh, interesting enough, actually, Colchester does have a really variable, they do feed their chicks a lots of different sorts of things. There are the feral pigeons, and actually in this swift picture here, you can see some colorful neck feathers of feral pigeons, along with these swift feathers, but they bring back lots of different wading birds, including bar-tailed godwit, black-tailed godwit, turnstone, wimbrel, they eat terns, such as this juvenile common tern here, and even an avocet. So the, 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 the prey remains that, that Michael has sent me has actually been really, really quite varied, and no doubt a reflection of where Colchester is, and perhaps the sorts of places that the peregrines at Colchester are accessing to get these birds. And going back to my conundrum about, well, are peregrines eating these birds in the towns or cities are going out? Well, I still think it's a bit of both. I suspect that some of these prey species are being caught as they fly over, say, Colchester, but I suspect the peregrines are also heading out to places such as Abbotton Reservoir, uh, where they can actually find some of these birds as well, which leads me on in a minute to my next um, story. Um, actually, I put this in slightly the wrong place, but it was just to also say, actually, that, that um, one of the young males that has hatched from Colchester was actually found dead at Charing Cross Hospital. I think it ended up in a dispute with the breeding male there. Um, so it's just to say that although we've had the female from the Netherlands, also we have had the recovery of one of the Colchester birds all the way in uh, the middle of London, which is really, really interesting. So let me carry on just for the last five minutes or so, five or ten minutes now with the remaining part of this story about how um, peregrines might be getting some of this more unusual prey. So certainly during the breeding season, we're seeing that feral pigeons and starlings are important, along with swifts in some places, common terns in some places, chaffinches in others. But at this time of the year in the autumn, the diet becomes much more varied. It, it becomes, feral pigeons are still important, but lots of other things become important as well. So for example, in October, and November, woodcock become very important. Um, red wings become very important. Teal duck carry on throughout the winter, particularly in December, January time. And one thing that was going on was that I was finding the prey remains of species that I thought, well, hold a minute here. How can a peregrine possibly be catching this during the day? This is a shy species. It's a species difficult to see as a bird watcher. But it's also a bird that uses habitats that would be difficult for a peregrine to interrogate and get into. Yes, peregrines will sometimes fly very low over fields and reams and rushes to perhaps surprise a teal or a snipe. But there were species that really could be quite difficult for a bear again to catch, apart from one thing. One thing all these species had in common was that they migrate at night. And of course, if you are a bird like a little grebe or a quail or a corncrake or even a teal duck, then actually it's good to migrate at night. It's cooler air, so when you're generating lots of heat, you can keep cool. But importantly, you can keep out of the way of predators because you can fly under the cover of darkness. That is until, of course, people invented streetlights. And streetlights shine up into the night sky, perhaps less so with some of the modern street lighting, but nonetheless, there's still a lot of glow from urban locations. And actually, if you're a duck or you've got a pale breast, for example, then actually your pale breast reflects that street lamping and you're a flying beacon. And if any of you have ever been into uh, a town or a city in the middle of the night, particularly this time of the year, and you've got urban gulls, for example, then you will see how easy they are to see even at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the evening if you're coming out of a restaurant or, or a pub or somewhere like that. So what we've been able to, or what I'm very proud to be associated with, and, and a number of different people started to realise this in the 1980s in Berlin, for example, and then technology has helped us actually confirm this, is that peregrines aren't thinking about going to sleep in the evening, unlike maybe a Kestrel or a Merlin is. No, peregrines are actually starting to become very alert and very active, just like this bird is here on Worcester Cathedral. And what we were able to confirm as technology got better and infrared technology got better, uh, we got the first confirmation of night hunting, which we suspected. And it was first, this is in Taunton, but it was first confirmed in Derby 
where the technology was recording peregrines bringing back live woodcock, live teal duck and live snipe in the middle of the night. And this was a real revolutionary moment because I, you know, we'd, we'd suspected that peregrines were, were, were catching prey at night and technology caught up with this idea and was able to prove that this really does happen. So for example, here we have a peregrine in the middle of the Taunton, in the middle of the night, uh, with a moorhen that is just brought back in. Now, sometimes they'll bring it back dead, but fresh. Sometimes the birds are still wriggling. Here we have, for example, a peregrine that's just brought back um, a till duck in Taunton. And this video footage here, I won't show you too much of it because it, it's a bit, bit sort of gory, but, but this is showing you um, a panting peregrine and it's bringing back a live woodcock that it's caught at about 11 o'clock in the evening in Taunton. So it's gone out, it's spotted this woodcock migrating over Taunton and it's brought the bird back to then dispatch and, and kill. And often the following day, you may well find the remains of these birds. This was actually in Dorchester, this woodcock. And, um, and what we know from observations is that whereas during the daytime, peregrines tend to go up high and stoop hunt or surprise their prey, what they're observed doing in urban locations is kind of hiding in the shadows, flying out, not very far, perhaps 50, 50 metres, 100 metres, a couple of hundred metres at most to catch their prey and then bringing it back. And I was even working with um, Apple Plus last year where they were filming in Chicago, where they've got remarkable footage of peregrines catching migrating warblers. But of course, the, the lighting is so bright, it's almost like daylight in these places and of course all these small warblers get disorientated and the peregrines very very able to pluck all these birds out of the air and here we've got for example a woodcock that was taken um on the 4th of november in leicester and uh, jim graham who monitors the the peregrines here they, they bring their prey unusually they bring their prey back to the nest tray that's quite unusual um, to actually still be getting prey data at this time of the year. Very often they use gargoyles and perches and things like that. And what they tend to do is they cache their prey. So they often hide their prey in nooks and crannies and crevices. And this is exactly what they're doing with the nest tray in Leicester. They're bringing their prey back. And here we've got um, a half-eaten woodcock, for example. Now, woodcock may be taken at dusk sometimes. They do sometimes fly during the day, but I'm certain that most woodcock are being caught at night on migration as they're migrating over our towns and cities. And this is another example on the 17th of, of October this year in Leicester at 20 past 10 in the evening, where a peregrine has just caught um, a, a prey. Can't quite tell what it is here, but you can see the peregrine's actually caching it away so it can come back to this the following day to eat. So this is usually the nest location. As I say, this is quite unusual for them to use the nest location in the winter time, but there she is just putting it into place. And the next day we were able to identify it actually, and the prey species it had brought back was a jack snipe. And for those of you who know jack snipe, these are very secretive birds, very difficult to see. You can always tread on these birds before they fly up. But importantly, like the snipe uh, and teal duck and other things, they do migrate at night and uh, we're pretty certain that this would have been caught at night and was fresh and then brought back to be caged. And if you look actually just above the jack snipe, you'll also see that the Leicester peregrines around the same sort of time have eaten a golden plover. Uh, there's a couple of yellow spotted feathers just at the top here. And this is an example of a cache in Taunton. And you can see here they're not using the nest site. They're using a ledge here where there's a mixture of woodcock, Till duck, moorhen, uh, perhaps a starling in here as well. So there's a real myriad of different prey. And they're doing this really because they don't necessarily need to eat a woodcock in a whole day. They might eat the equivalent of a pigeon a day or, or, or a pigeon over a few days. When they've not got chicks to feed, they don't necessarily need to be eating a whole pigeon a day necessarily, depending on the weather conditions. And sometimes they'll also collect more prey than they need for a snowy day, very cold weather conditions where prey may disappear in response to cold weather, particularly snow. And so they've got this kind of cache built up for them. So just to finish off, really, what I'm very excited about with this story about peregrines is the fact that where you are, wherever you are in Essex, where you've got urban dwelling peregrines, they will be hunting at night at this time of the year. 
Um, they will be feeding on things like little grebes, woodcock, quail, water rail, corn crakes, and even species we may not always think about as being nighttime migrants, such as bramblins and dunnocks, for example, they will also take. And my theory on this is that this is in response to them doing this naturally with moonlight. We do find this behavior happening in South America, Australia, uh, Southern Asia, parts of Africa. So I think that this behavior is probably an exaggeration of behavior they would normally do under the stimulation of, of, of moonlight. And then they're doing it more so under street lights. So as I mentioned earlier, during the daytime, they're doing their circling, their stoop diving. And then at night, they're, they're standing in the shadows and then flying out to catch their prey. And finally, just in the last minute, I just want to talk a bit about um, Sally the Peregrine. This was a peregrine that we were very lucky enough to tag in 2017 with Spring Watch. Here we've got Dave Anderson from Scotland who came down to help tag the bird and Phil Sheldrake here from the RSPB. She's got a special kind of falconry cap on to keep her nice and calm. And she was having a special tag put on her back. And you can see her here with a couple of chicks. And you can see her here with the tag on her back. It's uh, collecting uh, data about her position. She's just calling to the mail here, but importantly, it's solar powered. So it's, it's collecting obviously the sun's energy to be able to transmit data to the mobile network. And here she is just picking up, I think a starling from, um, from the mail who's just brought it in for her. And so as part of my PhD, I'm also looking at the movements that she's taken to better understand how a peregrine is using its urban environment. Um, and although she's only N equals one, sample size one, it's still better than nothing. And you can see here actually that there's a, a, a huge amount of clusters around Salisbury and some of the outskirts. In her second year, she got ousted actually. She didn't have her mate, uh, sorry, in the second year, she didn't have a mate, but she stayed in Salisbury. But then in the third year in 2019, she got ousted and actually went on travels around Wiltshire. And these are all this kind of triangular pattern you can see here. And interesting enough, you can see that even though she's an urban dwelling peregrine, she's often using pylons. So there's lots of clusters along pylons in straight lines where she was using. Anyway, I just wanted to fit that in at the end. There was a bit of an interesting story just to say there's more to come uh, with regards to what we're very much learning about urban peregrines. And I hope this evening has very much given you a flavour of um, where we've where we've come with peregrines from them being very rare birds to now being very common in urban locations and and hopefully I've brought Essex the county of Essex in there enough to for you to get a flavour of perhaps how things are going to change in Essex over the coming years. If you want to find out more about peregrines in more detail I've also written a book on urban peregrines which gives you uh, detail but, but in it but in a kind of accessible way it's not written in a, in a sort of hugely kind of scientific way it's written in a way that, that um, you know anybody can pick up and understand. And if some of you are also interested in prey remains and, and looking out for the remains of, of species in urban locations, then I've also got a book called Raptor Prey Remains, which goes through photographs of the initial things you often find under a location such as a peregrine prey uh, roost. So it's not the ultimate kind of ID book of feathers. It's, it's the prey species that you're most likely to find when you turn up at a peregrine site, for example, and, and a peregrine's been eating a woodpecker or lapwing or something like that. So I hope that you've enjoyed this evening. I hope it's been an interesting story um, about, first of all, uh, the success of the peregrine, what we're finding out about their movements, how they're radiating out over towards the eastern counties where, where, where many of you will be living, but then also what we're finding out about the diet. And of course, it's the diet that both has led to their demise in many parts of the country where they get persecuted, but also it's the success of the peregrine in many of our urban locations. And the fact that they're not just relying on pigeons, they're also relying on a whole variety of prey. And an urban dwelling peregrine is also relying on many different prey species that are associated with the countryside, which they're intercepting often at night. So I shall finish there.